taught a workshop today in which I made a case for inviting people to have a more contemplative practice. And one of my fellow teachers in the workshop asked me a question that I've gotten asked many times, which was, what do you do about that student who comes and just wants to work out and they're pushing as hard as they can, even though you're telling them to be more measured? And I asked her, I said, has this person come to your class more than once? And she said, yeah, he comes all the time. And I said, oh, well, if he keeps coming... I think you need to take that as an indication that some part of him recognizes a value. He wouldn't keep coming, even though he's kind of like seemingly not doing what you're suggesting. I think you might just want to be a little bit patient. And I offered a few suggestions about how I might engage that person. And that kind of conversation can be really useful as teachers, and we don't always have an opportunity to have them which is why I started my weekly teacher's class where a group of podcast listeners like yourself join me for a live video call and we hash some stuff out and it's incredibly supportive and all kinds of great stuff's coming out of it. If you'd be interested in something like that, I encourage you to check it out. It's the J. Brown Yoga Weekly Teacher's Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, the respective buttons on both sides of the time-space continuum between us have been pressed. And that means, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. And gosh, I am very happy to be with you, coming to you remote from Christchurch, New Zealand. I made it. 30 hours. It's a 30-hour trip. That is by far the longest trip I've ever made to get somewhere, but I made it. And you know what? I'm feeling pretty good. Those of you who were listening last week, you know I I had some, some issues present the week before I was supposed to leave, and I was worried. I'm not going to lie. I was very concerned. Like, if that pain issue got worse, which it has in my life at other times, I, I would really not be in a good place. But you know what? I feel fine. I slept on the plane, which I never do, and I adjusted pretty quick, and my body's feeling good. I taught my workshop today, the first one, and it went great. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling ready for the rest of the trip. So I made some good choices before I left. I did some things that I needed and took care of myself, and I think that has paid off. And that is a lesson that has taken me a long time to learn but I feel pretty good about the fact that I was able to meet my needs enough that I am doing well. Now, New Zealand definitely has a role to play in it because it has a very uh, easy to be here kind of feeling to it. I don't know if that's just my host. Let me give them a little shout out. Victoria from Hot Flow Yoga Christchurch. Very appreciative. I learned a few things about Christchurch that like eight years ago or something, basically the whole town was completely destroyed by a crazy amount of earthquakes out of nowhere. Basically just like wiped out the whole sections of the town. And they've just been kind of like rebuilding from there ever since. And seems like they're kind of getting to a place where it's really starting to come back. And that's very exciting to be around. But then I saw the news about all the fires on the West Coast in America and you know, I grew up on in the West Coast. I have still no people there. And I just, I, I can't help but think, man, the planet is trying to tell us something. Are we going to like ever listen to that? Or anyways, anybody listening on the West Coast, I hope you're okay. I hope you're safe. My heart goes out to anybody who's dealing with that. Fire is coming through and like, Burning down your life is not an easy thing. So hang in there if you're somebody out there listening to this now. And just everybody listening, I hope you're okay. Really appreciate all the notes I got this week. Part of the reason why I think I'm doing well is 
I felt like I got support. People out there listening and just in their minds going, oh, I hope you're going to be okay, Jay. I hope you feel better. And just like, I really believe that all of you out there thinking that actually helped me get better. And I've talked about that before where sometimes I feel like I get something from you, the listener. So thank you very much. It's that kind of mutual support and mutual aid that I think is how we're going to find any ways to move forward. Now, I have an excellent conversation to share with you today with Jenny Wilkinson Priest. I met Jenny a few years ago. She came to Brooklyn when I still had the center. She took my class and then we had lunch. And ultimately, she brought me to Tri Yoga London. I taught there last year. I'm returning there again this January. And Jenny is just an incredibly smart and serious-minded practitioner. I have thoroughly enjoyed the dialogue and debate that I have had with her, both on and off the record since we met. And she is also a very devout Ashtanga practitioner, as you will hear. It has been transformative in her life. She practices in a traditional way, and she explains what that means to her. And I think it was a little bit risky of her, frankly, to come on and have this conversation with me, knowing that I was going to share it with everybody like this. But she did, and she was totally honest and transparent in a way that I really value. And I think she offers an important perspective, and I think it potentially holds some keys for people moving forward in this post-lineage time or whatnot. So please, I want you to really listen. And, you know, you can reach out to me. Let me know what you think. I'm sure Jenny would like to hear it as well. That's why we did this, to see if we could move the conversation forward. Now, let me mention, next week, I am going to bring you a conversation I had with Karen Rain. And I'll say more about it on the other side, a little bit more about what's coming next week. But I did want to let people know in the intro that that is going to be sort of the third in this series on the Patabi Joyce and Ashtanga community situation. So just to know, you might want to tune into that. I think it's an important talk that will be shared next week. And I will say just a little bit more about it on the other side of today's episode. Before we get to it, though, let me ask you if you are currently using MindBody Online. I know most people who like run centers or studios are because there's kind of like a seeming monopoly on it, but there is an alternative. And I used that alternative for seven plus years when I had a center in Williamsburg. And it is today's sponsor of the podcast, KarmaSoft. If you're not familiar with it, I do want to encourage you to check it out. Rudy Senecal, the owner of KarmaSoft, is a longtime friend of mine. He's been on the podcast before. I, I encourage you to listen to the episode. We talk all about the company and how he runs it and what my experience of using it was. I really think it is an incredibly useful tool for anybody who has to do the work of scheduling classes and doing accounting and all of that stuff that goes into running an operation, this is a way to make it more efficient and easier to do that work. Go check it out, karmasoftonline.com. Let me also drop my stuff. I'm going to be in Auckland, New Zealand next week, and there are actually a few spots left. If I am not mistaken, there's still a little room. If you're in the neighborhood, Auckland, New Zealand, November 24th and 25th, then I am going to be in London, January 11th through 13th, and then Tel Aviv, Israel, January 18th through 20th. You can find out about those gigs and more, and you can find the archives of this podcast and read my blog and find my online yoga video stuff, including my live stream subscription. I just got a class off from New Zealand today. Very cool. If you want to get in on any of that stuff, you can find it at jbrownyoga.com. 
All right, then. I think that's fine. I will touch base with you on the other side and mention a few things there. For now, let's go ahead and get to this. Let's listen to this talk that I had with Jenny Wilkinson Priest. Hello. There he is. Wow, we finally made it. I think there's some ghosts in the machine today. I had my tech guy come in here, and he said something about a firewall. If you can tell me what that means, then. I don't know. <laughs> something, a firewall. Well, I don't know if whose firewall it is or which firewall is blocking us, but for some reason, <laughs> we can make it happen the other way avenue. But we are, we are talking to one another now. Indeed, indeed. How are you? I'm doing okay, all things considered. My day's just getting started, so I don't even really know yet. <laughs> 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 I kind of was up late working, and so now I'm I'm stumbled out of bed, had a little breakfast, and just talking to you. But your your day's already up and running. It's midday for you, right? It is. It's one twenty. We had um, our clocks went back yesterday, so oh, um, we got right. we got the extra hours sleep. I think you guys, your clock doesn't go back until um, in a couple weeks' time. I think. I guess I have no idea. I don't even pay attention until like a couple of days before. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true yoga teacher. I had to send out um, an email to all the yoga teachers to remind them that the clocks go back because invariably somebody doesn't show up on time. Every time, right? Every time. Every single time. <laughs> well, cool. You're in the middle of your work day, though. How would your morning go? Good. Uh, pretty good. Yeah. For a Monday, got my practice in. So that's always helpful to set me off on, on the right step. But, Are you uh, like a, yeah. like an early morning, like 4am kind of person? I or? am. Oh I'm gosh. one of those. I'm one of those. But you yeah. got to go to bed early in order to do that. Well, I mean, I don't really sleep that much or that well. <laughs> um, and I just, I can't, there's no other time for me to do it. Literally right. no other time. I got, you know, with the kids and the family and work, if I, if I don't get up at four, then it just doesn't happen for the rest of the day. So I hear you. I hear you. But then are you pooped out earlier in the day or no? You did, like you said, you don't sleep that much anyway, so. I mean, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'd say by like 1030, I'm pretty pretty much done yeah um and i i I start to head to bed so you know i guess if you go if i went to bed yeah if you could go to bed at 10 30 or 11 then i think you could make it happen because i sometimes only get five or six hours but i don't go to bed until late so that would that make the early morning impossible yeah yeah but that's not why we came to talk to each other today solely to just find out our pra- Although that's actually a good subject, like our practice patterns, you know, and like, because I was talking about that, like on my teacher's class, like when people get their practice in and one mm. of the teachers was talking also about how when she goes to do her self practice, she just feels like she's doing lesson planning for teaching, like, mm. like separating it out and really having your own practice. So if getting yeah. up at four in the morning makes that happen and you get up at four in the morning, right? I do. I get up. Um, sometimes it can be difficult because I do run into, you know, where I practice. There's also a lot of teachers there because it's really a teacher's shala. So I, I really have to set my boundaries. Like, we are not talking about work. This is my <laughs> practice time. <laughs> mm. So sometimes so wait, the, that can be difficult. The shala is open at 4 a.m.? Yep. The shala wow. is open probably at about the first person gets there because the early, early birds, as we call ourselves, we all have keys. Mm. So the first person's there probably at about 3.15. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 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 Ooh. And it, it stays open until about 11. And then there's also evening classes for those people who it works better for them to practice in the evening. You know, there's, there's a good portion of people who, whether they're actors or waiters or whatever job that they have, that the early mornings just don't work because they work late. Mm-hmm. So they have different options. So I think whatever works for you works really Right. Well, you know, I, I was thinking about getting ready to talk to you and it's one of those situations where you're somebody I've met and had rapport with and considered you a friend, but we've never really sat down and talked for a whole hour even. No. And that's been happening with even friends of mine I've known for years and years and years. It's one of my favorite things about doing this is it like gives me the structure to like talk to people I know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I know I don't I know a few things about you, but not a lot. I know that you had like a former life before your life there in London. 
I know that yes. you were you were a reporter in New York. That's is that right? Yes. Yes. And I guess did you did you grow up on the East Coast? Like where where'd you grow up? I, I did. I was born in Manhattan, um, and then I actually moved to London when I was about seven. Mm. My father's work transferred him over here, and I was here for a good five years. And then I moved back to New York, and I went to high school in New York. Um, and then university, I went to undergrad at Michigan State. I'm a Spartan. And then I did um, my grad school at, at Northwestern. Um, and then I became a journalist and thus began a series of jobs moving around the world, really, before I ended up here in London. Wow. Well, what was reporting? What kind of, what kind of reporting were you doing? Did you specialize or did you dabble around in lots of different stuff? Um, I started off at, you know, uh, small daily newspapers, as most, you know, journalists start their careers on the East Coast in, like, Connecticut. And then I worked for a business newspaper in the city, Investors Business Daily. I don't even know if they're still publishing. Um, and then I joined Reuters, where I spent, you know, most of, most of my time, and I covered financial markets. Um, so it, it was, and I was also in Washington where I covered, um, politics. Ooh. So it was a mixture of like, like I was big into, um, I did a lot of Latin American sovereign debt, um, especially in the early noughties. And when I was working in Washington, I was working, um, I did stint at the white house covering Clinton, which was pretty cool. Mm. Um, and, and then after, Reuters. I moved to Singapore and I worked for Time Magazine there for a few years. So, yeah. I mean, I'm curious because I'm guessing that, you know, I know that things have changed in journalism a lot, as many mm. things with the advent of the internet. But back then, it was a little bit of a different time. So it sounds like kind of an exciting gig. It was. It was really cool. I, I loved print journalism, um, and I actually also really enjoyed working at a newswire because the deadlines at a newswire are super tight. Like, you are in competition by the second. So if you're waiting to receive a decision from the Federal Reserve on whether they're going to lift or lower interest rates, you've got seconds to call that story in because it can mean the difference of, you know, hundreds of thousands of way more um, to traders working on the New York Stock Exchange or the bond markets, whatever it is. So that, that fast pace, I really, I really loved. Um, and then the print journalism, it was, you know, it was, it was fast too. And especially when I was working at a, a small town newspaper in Connecticut, it was called the Waterbury Republican American. Um, but that was like small town politics and it was really corrupt <laughs> and it was it was really interesting to cover. I loved it. I loved it. Did you have to like stand in hallways with a microphone in people's yep. faces? Yep. Wow. I did that whole thing. And you worked for a, <laughs> the Republican American. Was so was it like a right wing kind of publication? It, or? Not as much as it sounds, um, but it definitely I'd say its editorial pages leaned right. Um, I was fresh out of grad school at that point. And, you know, I would say that of all the newspapers that I've worked in and the magazines, I do believe, because it was my experience, despite what Donald Trump says, that the reporters try to be really fair. Yes, they have their op-ed pages in which whatever leanings are revealed. But as far as the reporters themselves, you know, the fourth estate, it's, it's like we have we had a sworn duty that we would cover things fairly. And no matter who you worked for, everybody that I knew, all of the colleagues that I've known over the years have always done that. So I find it somewhat hurtful to sit from a distance now and, and watch the fourth estate just get summarily ripped apart for leaning right, leaning left. When, when I know those people and that's not how they work their stories it's just not. Well, I really appreciate that. But I think that's what I was sort of pointing to when I said that things have changed in journalism. I was watching a documentary just the other day, and it was sort of tracking when the news industry went from like a public utility to like all of the big corporations buying up all the individual stations when cable hit in America. Yeah. Yeah. And how basically it just changed the whole game where suddenly you had like GE owning ABC or whatever. And yeah. so that meant 
that it was about ratings and profits rather than mm. just hard news and stuff and mm. sort of how journalists have had to navigate that ever since. I think absolutely there's, there's a degree of that. And I can't, as much as I don't want to say that it, it, it can happen, it, it does. There are interests that can sway people. And, and I remember, you know, 20 years ago, we were talking about how news was becoming shortened because people's attention span was narrowing and you couldn't write these in-depth stories because you just wouldn't keep people for that long. Right. And, and the conversation has is, is changed over the years into um, how you're reporting a story and whether you're revealing any of your own inner biases or tendencies based on who owns the newspaper or what your particular political leanings are. Um, but I do maintain that the journalists that I knew back then, and I still know a lot of them who were working, you know, at the Washington Post and the New York Times, like these are good people <laughs> trying to get, you know, to the heart of the matter. They really are. Um, I agree with that. I don't think it's a journalist. I think they're all doing their best, but I think somebody else is the one who makes final decisions on shit. And so sometimes it doesn't matter how good work the journalists do. Yeah. If somebody yeah. at the top who pulls the strings and decides on shit. Yeah. Yep, they can kill a story like that, for yeah. sure. Yeah, but I hear you. And so, wow, that's crazy. And when in that mix did I did you start yoga becoming a, a thing for you? I guess I was thinking about that because <laughs> I was like, when, when did it become a thing? When, while you were <laughs> doing this whole reporting gig, did you have time to go to a yoga class, if ever? Well, yeah, I mean, before I started as a journalist, I worked in a book publishing company and my editor sent me to go check out this uh, yoga teacher who had a book proposal. So that was like my first ever class. I thought it was really bizarre, but there was something about it that intrigued me, not necessarily the teacher, but what she was teaching. Um, so, and then I saw an ad for Bikram yoga, right? So many people get drawn in through Bikram yoga. We have to thank them for something. I think. Mm. <laughs> was it something about the ad that struck you or was just the one that you saw? It was like somebody with a really sexy, great body. Mm -hmm. I was like, I want that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So I went to this, I think it was like on Spring Street in Soho or something. You would probably remember because you were in yeah. Manhattan then in the 90s. Was it, was it on Spring Street? This like third floor walk up to a carpeted room? Yes, there was a spot. I don't remember if it was on Spring Street or not, but yeah, I yeah. do recall a Bikram studio down there. Yeah. And I, I remember I took my then boyfriend and <laughs> He passed out midway through the class. <laughs> like literally like fainted literally to the ground? Literally just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but I loved it. it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I did. Um, and I kind of continued to, to practice on and off like random forms. There was nothing really pulled me. Mm -hmm. um, and then... I, w I was in Chicago going to grad school and then I came back and I was dabbling still a little bit. And then I came back to, um, to New York and that's when I went to my first Ashtanga class mm, in New York, um, in New York. And it was, you know, I, can't, I don't remember who the teacher was. It was at a gym and, and I quite liked it. And then I saw that this guy, Patabi Joyce was coming to, to New York, who was, you know, the founder of Ashtanga yoga. So I was like, okay, I'll give that a try. Mm. Didn't, I didn't know anything, anything about him. Um, but I was welcome in there and I had really very, very little experience. Um, but I don't really remember too much of that because that, it was in 2001. Mm. When, was it one of those um, big ones at the puck building or was it? Yep. yep. Yeah. That was like 600 people. It was like big. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But that's when 9-11 happened. So oh, that was kind that, of. Was that right before, right after the, that gig? right in the middle of it. So my Whoa. life was like completely disrupted by that because well, I was, I was covering it for, for Reuters and it was just, it was a difficult time. I think anybody my age, my generation living in New York knew somebody who, you know, lost their lives that day. Um, I certainly did. So I don't really remember too much about Patavi Joyce practicing with him because, you know, 9-11 was, you know, it was, it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, I understand. I, I had a friend who was actually medical examiner in Manhattan 
and it totally, I don't know, it really, after, really messed him up bad. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I, I was out of town. I was at the Omega Institute on the day. I was back yeah. in the city, I believe it was three days after, and I lived in the Lower East Side. So I was there, and it, it certainly, anybody who was, I don't, it's one of those uh-huh. things like, where were you when it happened? You know, like, yeah. it totally just rocked reality in, a, in a, such a profound yeah. way. Yeah. And I'm it's sorry, good. sorry that we lost friends. <laughs> yeah. So, it was, I don't, you know, it's just kind of one of those things that stays with you forever. And sometimes, like, my kids will want to talk about it. And I'm like, I just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, too, it's still so yeah. raw and real. I hear you. And so did you, did you, did yoga become something that helped you with that? Definitely. I think, um, I I don't, you know, people respond to trauma in all sorts of different ways. And I think, um, for me, what I noticed only in hindsight was that I I had difficulty like feeling things Hmm. (laughs) after what I had seen and gone through. So what I found myself doing in yoga was like really, really pushing it mm. to the point where I was like, Oh, I can feel that. I mean, it didn't necessarily feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I totally get it. I did the same thing. Like I didn't know what I, I didn't know how to feel either for like other reasons, not because I was covering nine eleven, but other things. But yes, I had the same experience. Part of going for like an extreme practice was I needed this and say, I needed to feel something. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, that's um, definitely yoga. Yoga played a part in it, I would say, in my whatever coping mechanism after that. And also, you, I think I know that you, you also had a bit of a background as like a competitive gymnast, right? So you were already kind of physically oriented. You had some of that in you already, right? Yes, for sure. And, you know, I'm always careful to point that out to people because... They're going to give you that thing. They're going to be like, see, that's why you whatever you can do. Everybody I know. Well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm not going to look. It's not to say that there was no hard work along the way because there was. But, you know, even like I went to the one summer I went to camp at the at the Olympic camp in upstate New York. And nobody was putting their heads, legs behind their head back then. Let's just (laughs) put that out there. You know, you might have been doing double backs, but you weren't. Well, that might not actually be a good thing for that. Like you would train your body to do that thing. Right. And that it might not be great to have your leg behind your head, depending on what, you know, event you're doing or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, I definitely have that um, background and it's, it's stayed with me. So for sure, I think that my ability to practice certain asanas absolutely stems from my um, younger years as a competitive gymnast for sure. Mm. And were you starting to do that kind of like a stronger practice in New York? Like after Patabi Joyce came, did you continue practicing in New York or when did it really start to happen for you more in earnest, like a regular, a stronger practice? So about two or three months after nine 11, um, I moved to Singapore and I, that's when I found a teacher and that's when I started daily practice. In Singapore? In Singapore, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. There was a a Ashtanga community in Singapore? There was. It was small, um, but the teacher, she taught, you know, quite traditionally. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a good community of people. And she taught me primary series. Wow. And when you say traditionally, what does that mean? So there was no lead classes. Um, She taught it as I am taught it now and as I teach it now. So, you know, very much following the sequence as is, um, moon days, taking days off for ladies holiday. Like it, it was, it was all there and it just felt right for me. And I'm always curious about the traditional way and whether or not the first time you did the first time you go, did you do a whole primary series practice or just, no, part? no, yeah. just part. Cause it was in a gym and you know, I, it was, wasn't appropriate to do. See, that's it's an interesting open. thing because anybody I've talked to who ever has learned it in a more quote unquote traditional way, that seems to me to be one of the defining characteristics. It wasn't like, 
it tended to be brought about in stages rather than getting thrown into the full primary series the first time you show up. For sure. It was, I think that would be totally inappropriate and not traditional to, to bring somebody into a room and teach them all the way through the primary. I mean, even now when I teach, I have an open level class that is an hour and 15 minutes and I will only take people to um, Mary Chastain A mm. because it's not appropriate mm. to mm-hmm. go any further. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Let's come back to that. I want to know then, so you end up, you're in Singapore. Why do you leave Singapore? Is your, are you still reporting and doing that job? Yeah, I was working for Time Magazine. I was their Southeast Asian correspondent there. Mm. And so when, I know you made a stop in Paris, I think, and then you land in London. Is that just jumping around to different gigs? Yeah, I, um, we went to Paris. Um, we were in Singapore for about two and a half years, and then we went to Paris um, for for about a year. There's no yoga in Paris. <laughs> None, none. <laughs> when you say um, we, is that is that a partner? Oh, I I got married. Yeah, okay. I got married, and I started to have um, kids, which you know really disrupts things quite a lot. In so wait, life. you had kids <laughs> while you were traveling around? I had uh, my first was born in Singapore. Oh, okay. Um, and then we moved to to Paris, and I couldn't work as a journalist there because I did not have a European passport. Mm. So, um, what I ended up doing was going to Cordon Bleu for, for the year that I was there. Cause I was, I really loved to cook and I thought, okay, like I can see kids are disrupting my road to a Pulitzer prize. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd like to shift it and try to get a, a Michelin star. I mean, neither one of those things happen. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I got um, it. Well, hey, you like to aim high. I could appreciate that. <laughs> So, but I loved it. Paris was great. Um, It was a year of cooking and there was, you know, it was home practice when I could because there, there were no shalas there. There's, you know, I don't think Parisians really like um, to do any form of, of bodily um, exercise or anything. That might be different now. That might be different now. I bet there's some, I bet you could find an Ishtanga class in Paris. You can, you can, Yeah. yeah, you can, you can. But not at that time. At that time, you, you were just you at home, which is very appropriate because it is self-practice, but it's yeah. also nice to have a place to go to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I was there for a year and then I came to London. Okay. And you, then you guys, sort of, that became, you guys sort of settled there and set some roots, I guess, because you're still there now. Correct. Correct. So it's been 14 years, I think, or 15, coming on 15 years. Yeah. And yeah. I've seen some of your posts. You've got four boys. That's crazy. I know. It's, I you, wake up I, every day and say, this is crazy. How the hell did this happen? I see. It's like you once referred to them as an army of boys. And it literally look, is that army of boys. Yeah, I know. Crazy, yeah. crazy. <laughs> so are you, so I wonder about that because I know my, my wife, like she's just now getting back into the studio now that my mm-hmm. youngest is turning four. Right. So it does seem like sometimes being a mom kind of you have to put take off whatever career hat you might have had for a little while sometimes and do that. I mean I guess some women are able to do both, but for you did you have to kind of put down your stuff for a while to be a mom? Absolutely. Um I did not work for, you know, several years while they were growing up and there's a, a combination of reasons. I mean, being American, I think Americans women go back to work really quickly. And I wanted to do that, but the care in this country is so much, it's very expensive to either put your child in nursery or to have somebody who, to come to your home or whatever it is, whereas it's you know a lot more affordable in the States. Mm. So it was really a matter of just, it didn't make financial sense for me to go back to work. And, and I was really glad that I didn't because I got to spend those years with the kids and I, you know, I had them really all tight together. I had four in the space of five and a half years. So there was no, I had a lot of work to do at home. Yes, Cause they were all little around the same time. That's crazy yeah. town. Did you have help? Yeah. Did you have some help? I did not. I broke <gasps> down finally when I was pre- got pregnant with the fourth and I got an au pair. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. You really went through with some fire there then. Yeah. 
Wow. For sure. But it's worth it. You know, they're, they're older now. They're amazing. They're fun. Well, the point I wanted to get to is that I've been sort of thinking, and I've said this to my wife too, that her best shit is yet to come. Like, I feel like it, I know that some part of her worries that now that she's had these years away from it, it's been too long or something, but I don't believe it. I think her work's going to be even better when she goes back, gets back into it now. Yeah. I mean, I think that as a woman, if you have children and you take time out, you really need to think about how you come back and in what form, because there was no way I could go back to a journalism job, even though I missed it so much. It just, I couldn't piece it together where I could go back into it slowly over a period of time. By teaching yoga, I was able to kind of pick and choose and make my own schedule that worked around the kids. Right. And, and it wasn't until I was offered, you know, a full-time job at, at Tri-Yoga that um, when Jonathan offered me the job, I was trying to think of reasons not to do it. <laughs> and, yeah. and I realized that if that's what I'm doing, that I need to take this job because there's, you know, obviously I can do it now. The kids were old enough. I had the space. Mm-hmm. It's not been the easiest thing to work out. Like when I get home at seven o'clock, I'm like, Oh crap, I forgot dinner. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> yeah. but that's just being a working mom, like things, you know, laundry doesn't get done on one day and, and you know, the kids may have to wear dirty socks to school the next day, but that's all right. Hey man, those boys are old <laughs> enough okay. to do that. Those boys are probably old enough to do their own laundry at this Damn point. Damn straight yeah. they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it makes, it makes sense sometimes that yoga can kind of become a thing, especially since you had already established a practice for yourself. So it seems like teaching could be a, a good avenue. And I, I imagine food is, is a tough gig also. So yep. it wasn't yep. like you were going to try to go be in the restaurant all those hours on your feet. Yeah, I tried that. It just very quickly, I realized <laughs> it wasn't going to work very quickly. Wow. So then you took the gig at Tri Yoga. And what year was it when you took the gig at Tri Yoga? How long ago was that? I mean, I've been teaching a tri yoga for, I think, about eight or nine years, but oh. I took the job as yoga manager here just over two years ago. Okay, okay. And you were teaching at tri yoga, but I understand you're, you had a practice with Hamish, right? Hamish. Hamish, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so you, you practice at that. Uh, uh, Ashtanga Shah with Hamish, right? Yes, and I still do. Right, and so did that? Did you find him early on in London as you continued in your Ashtanga practice? Because I know you, you learned primary in Singapore, and then you went to UK. Did you did you go through some other teachers or other places before no. you landed there, or you just mm-hmm. found? That I went. I went straight to him. He was and is the only certified Ashtanga teacher in London. Mm. So I wanted to study with, you know, the best. And, and um, I knocked on the Shala door and I introduced myself and he just said, come on in. And that was 15 years ago. And I've been with him every day since. And do you do six days a week except for moon days? Yes. Wow. For all these years? Well, pregnancies have yeah, yeah, disrupted yeah. that somewhat, but yes, yeah, all these years. Wow. See, you're, you're a real Ashtanga practitioner, Jenny. <laughs> I mean, I, I can say that. I know you can't say that, but just because that's what it, in my, I know I just, that's a definition that I have in my mind of it. It's one of the mm-hmm. reasons why, like, I never felt that that I I don't know when I did that for a little while, I did some six days a week, except for moon days working with primary series and that, and it didn't, it wasn't my thing, but I know other folks who have and like you, and it's really the reason why I want to talk to you. Cause I've, I know folks like you who've had an Ashtanga practice like that for that many years that continues to work for them. Mm. And, you know, as I said to you in an email, they, they are right now, given everything that's been happening in the Ashtanga world, like a lot of them are really disheartened and mm-hmm. like kind of confused and they still have this deep love of the practice and they still do it every day and get all this benefit from it. And yet they don't feel like they can tell people they're Ashtanga practitioners or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I've had, you know, I, I've had a conversation with Gregor Mall. 
And he's someone also who continues to utilize that practice. Although he seemed to have moved away from some of the more traditional elements a long while back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess I wanted to reignite some of the conversation around the Ishtanga community after watching the Supreme Court confirmation here in, in America. Like, it got me really angry. I got really upset about it mm-hmm. in a way that I don't normally. Because from my viewpoint, I just thought there was so much, so much that was wrong about it. Yeah. And I felt like we, there was a, a bit of conversation that got started around what was happening in the Ashtanga community. And I know you were somebody who was putting yourself really out there and, and being vocal. And I know you started that petition to get Sherat to make a statement. But it yeah. does feel like that conversation has receded some. And I wanted to start it again, but not just to like call out people, but to talk about how people like yourself move forward Mm -hmm. while victims still get their, their due justice, whatever Mm -hmm. that might be. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering first for you, when when did you first know about stuff was going on? I mean, you've been in the community for a long time. Was there talk about it? Did you see anything? Because I know you, you took trips to Mysore too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, I first became aware of the abuse pretty soon after I um, met Joyce in 2001. So maybe like... Uh, six months after that because I was, when I was in Singapore, I was doing research on him because I wanted to know more about um, the practice. And I did come across some images and movies on the internet. And I heard people kind of making some, some really quiet comments about his Roman hands and his Russian fingers. Um, And I mean, I got to admit my first response was, I don't believe that. Um, I thought the photos were doctored, you know, especially the one that I would see of Tabi Joyce giving that Malabanda assistment assist in Pindasana. Do you know which one I'm talking about? I think so. And I guess, I guess I just didn't want to believe it. You know, I really didn't. And it also felt distant to me. And I, and then like over the course of those years until Mary Taylor's blog came out, I, I did come to believe it. You know, but but it did feel like it wasn't close to me because it wasn't my experience. And I just thought, well, I don't know what that is. Um, And I had had nothing but great respectful relationships with all my teachers and and my love of the practice. it It was undaunted, I have to say. So, yeah, I know that what I just said is not going to be a popular thing to hear, but you know, that, that is the truth of when I first heard about it. Um, but when Mary's blog first came out, I think I realized that it actually was my problem and it was, it wasn't something that I, as a teacher or here at my job at Treyoga, I just couldn't ignore it anymore and say that that it was somebody else's experience and not mine. Because I think doing that is a slap in the face to any woman who has suffered any kind of sexual assault at the hands of someone who is more powerful than they. And, and that's, that's just not right. Hmm. And did you, did you identify Patabi Joyce as your guru? No, never. Hmm. And why do you think that is? Because you made trips there. Was he at the Shala when you practiced there? Or you mainly, mainly worked with Shara? I was mainly with Shrat. I did practice with Tabby Joyce when he was on tour, um, but never in Mysore. So only with Shrat in Mysore. But but when Tabby Joyce was on tour, yes. I don't really believe in the the guru word, and I don't have a guru. I have a teacher. I think that's something completely different. Um, I respect my teacher, but I do not worship him, and. I, I just, I've never had a guru. Mm. I'm not saying I never won't, but I actually do not want that kind of relationship in my life where I'm giving everything away to that person. I will always want to question people in my life, no matter what my relationship is with them. So I don't see myself ever having a guru. Mm. But certainly there was like a lot of worship of him in the Ashtanga world. Did you feel pressure mm-hmm. to think of him that way? Or did you have to 
set a boundary or was it perfectly acceptable? I didn't feel pressure. No, I didn't feel pressure. I would see people, you know, bow down after practice and kiss his feet. And I never did that. I've never done it to Shrat. I've never done it to my teacher. It's just not something me as a woman or as a person, a human being, I would ever do. I just said that, that that's too strong of a statement and maybe in how I was raised to get down on my knees in front of somebody and kiss their feet. I just won't do it. So did I feel pressure? No, I was curious. I was watching people thinking, huh, look at that. But I never felt pressure. Right. And you did become authorized. What was that process for you? Did you have to ask? No, I did not ask. Um, I, Sharat gave me authorization. I, I remember he, he came up to me um, as I was doing my backbends with him, and he told me to come into his office later for the authorization papers. And, and I remember turning around and looking behind me and then looking back at him, and I said, are you talking to me? <laughs> mm. Because I just didn't expect it, and I I didn't really want it. I mean... It's just, it was, it was never important to me. And I know it is for a lot of people and I'm not trying to take anything away from them. But for me going to Mysore, it's about the practice and the practice has always been so much more important to me than the teaching of it. So, so yeah, I, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Finish the thought if you had one. Yeah. So, um, he authorized me and I, I, I've told you this already. I, I paid, um, the fees which were 90,000 rupees at the time. Um, and I got my certificate and I was, I was really happy. Mm -hmm. And then I came back home. I went to London, you know, back home to London and, you know, several months went by and I would occasionally check on the website to see if my name was on the list and it never was. Mm -hmm. And then a year went by and I was like, okay, maybe I should say something. I don't know, but I do remember. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.